This week I'm joined by Eric Miller, who is a professor of history at Geneva College. He is the author of multiple books, including Glimpses of Another Land, Political Hopes, Spiritual Longing, and Hope in a Scattering Time, A Life of Christopher Lash, alongside some others. In this episode, we discuss the life and work of Christopher Lash, alongside discussions on Christianity, theology, leftism, conservatism, and more. I'd like to thank all my paid subscribers and patrons for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support a Mythics podcast or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. So, Eric Miller, thanks very much for joining us on a Mythics podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to be here. We are going to be discussing the work of Christopher Lash, who you've written a biography of. Uh, many people will know him for his well, many of his texts, but largely for his texts, The Culture of Narcissism, uh, America in the Age of Diminishing Expectations, I believe is the full title. Um, so, but before we jump in with Lash, uh, and I do hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, because I've never actually had to pronounce it out loud. Uh, right, no, Lash, yes. Lash, okay. Um, yeah, Eric, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what it is you do, and, and why it is you were so interested and are so interested in Lash's work. Yeah. Well, I am a professor of history and the humanities at a liberal arts college uh, in Pennsylvania called Geneva College. And um, it's a uh, college started by Presbyterians in the 18, 1848 and uh, has been in this part of, part of Pennsylvania since about 18, since 1881, I think. So I direct the honors program uh, for undergraduates and uh, teach a history class here and there and um, do all kinds of things <laughs> that academics in my kind of position have to do. But long before that ever happened, I got interested in Lash because um, I was partly it was a vocational tra trajectory. I was in the midst of sort of discovering that I wanted to become an academic, a scholar, and I wanted to study um, American history in the, in, the, in the 20th century. I was very interested in intellectual and cultural history and social criticism, and so Lash became a name that I started to hear about. Um, but it also had to do with a kind of political ideological crisis of my own, which was I was coming of age uh, as a uh, as a as an american citizen in the age of uh the kind of reagan ascendancy all through my teenage years and then followed by george hw bush uh in the in the late 80s early 90s and then with the election of bill clinton in 92 uh when i was i think 24 uh actually 25 um i was just sort of shocked and uh, I had been left at the end of that political season with a sense that neither uh, of the two dominant parties in the U.S. Were, were was a party that I felt particularly inclined to attach myself to. Um, I'd grown very dissatisfied with the kind of thinking that I'd been exposed to in my in my childhood and and beyond. Um, and then I found this character, Christopher Lash. Uh, with this um, idiosyncratic but profound and and somehow stirring style of bringing together historical understanding with social criticism, and I just started to read. And the more I read, the more it made me think I needed to keep reading. And I've never stopped getting that feeling after reading Lash. Uh, I've it's um, it was years of my life spent one-on-one -on -one with a guy who always made me realize in no uncertain terms that I was not the smartest guy in the room. Um, and uh, so the need, the, the, the sense that he had, the effect that he had on me and so many others to keep going deeper, to keep reading more broadly, uh, was really responsible for, um, for the direction that I took, I think in a lot of ways. And then I got to graduate school and it turns out I started to talk about Lash, not realizing that he was sort of a persona non grata among the historical profession. And, uh, but there was one professor at the University of Delaware, uh, uh, an Iowa PhD named Guy Alchin, who, uh, who people described to me as a Lash aficionado. <laughs> so I, um, uh, 
I found my way to him. And eventually, a couple of years later, he encouraged me to actually pursue this book, uh, writing this book, because the papers had just been opened. And he said, this will be the chance for you to you know, <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of get in, be the first one into the archives, first one into these papers. And uh, amazingly enough, it ended up happening. So was that your was that your PhD? That was a PhD, yeah. Uh, okay, so Hope in a Scattering Time, which is the title of your biography, that came from your PhD or that was your PhD? Yeah, that came out of the, uh, that started with the PhD dissertation, then with some serious transformation a few years later, became a book. Okay. Are you, um, are you still dissatisfied with politics? With the political, the political <laughs> oh, choice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can't spend that much time studying Lash and end up feeling like you're happy at home, you know, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, you could feel happy at home, but not maybe nowhere else if you study Lash. No, there's a, yeah, the, this is not the moment to be thinking about political ideals. It's just basically survival <laughs> from this side of the pond, at least. Yeah, and just culture of narcissism just keeps to get keeps getting more poignant. And like, it's amazing. And like more glaringly obvious but more ignored it's crazy yeah the uh the the presidency uh in these years has just provided you know one sterling example uh, after another of all that lash was i think trying to see and of course not just the presidency but uh the whole dynamic the whole phenomenon um yeah Mm -hmm. So before we jump in specifically with Lash's thought, I do have to ask you the, the question specific or unique to this podcast, the Hermetics question. You can place three three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who do you pick? <laughs> As we're talking about Lash, we will include Christopher Lash in the room yeah. with three others. Who would you, who That's a would you put in there? That's a wonderful question that, that I've gone a few different ways in my mind, but where I've ended up is... Uh, with St. Augustine, mm -hmm. William Shakespeare, mm -hmm. John Updike. Okay. This is all, all very classical. <laughs> yeah. And this is really what got me to this was I realized that in a fundamental sense, I think Lash saw himself uh, most deeply as a writer and a writer who was very concerned to think about the relationship of soul and society and uh, and when he went to Harvard as a as a young atheist in 1950, uh, his parents were secularists. He um, he his father was a, a newspaper editor of some eminence. His mother was a PhD in philosophy, and he'd been raised in a I think he actually calls it somewhere a militantly secular home. And in 1950, he he goes to Harvard College, which in the aftermath of World War II and the great catastrophes of the first half of the century, uh, had developed a core curriculum required of all students in their first two years that was and re, re, would require them to read these classical texts. And when he read Augustine, he was sort of stunned into a kind of admiration. Uh, he writes home to his parents and says, I can't stand his theology, but there's something about the kind of effect of his intellect page by page that was just mag kind of magnetic for him. And I think it was the Augustinian um, anthropology uh, and the uh, the wonderfully kind of poignant style, the way of thinking about the self in relation to uh, the broader world, society, and all of that. And I think that's a key part of um, that becomes a kind of key part of Lash's way of um, of meeting people through his writing is at this sort sort of Augustinian intersection, I think. Um, but he uh, he aspired to become a writer. He goes, he meets John Updike in 1950, their roommates. Uh, and so it just would be very amusing to me to imagine uh, 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 Kit and John um, uh, hanging out with these two massively influential and important and magnificent writers and, and influences. Uh, when Lash dedicated each of his books, um he he chose a line from shakespeare along with the uh the person the family member to whom he dedicated the books uh as part of the dedication page but he uh he really he aspired to be a novelist he and Nov he and updike had a sort of running competition of sorts that he gradually realized he was losing um and as updike became fairly quickly uh a serious presence in american uh literary life uh 
it took him it took lash longer to to find his way up to a, a not quite a similar pinnacle but perhaps close for a social critic and um so yeah those are my three augustine shakespeare updike where do you where do you think that conversation might begin to begin to head hmm. well i think it might begin to head toward wit <laughs> I think it would be governed by wit, actually. I think that's um, uh, Lash loved nothing more than witty repartee that was not just shallow and superficial, but was sort of a reflection of a keener uh, register. <laughs> and uh, and so if you read one of the delights of this project, uh, which has now been many years ago that I did this this research, but... Uh, his correspondence was was just a marvel to read, a real treasury of American letters, um, and uh, and he th- he thrived in in that kind of witty exchange that had a kind of serious dimension to it, uh, and so I think that's sort of the the Shakespearean edge <laughs> I could see at least up like Lash. I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know so much about Augustine, but uh, so I think that would be one thing that would kind of lead such a conversation. But I think eventually um, the, uh, the prospect of deep human meaning in human community, and then the, uh, the sources of our perennial enduring frustrations and our attempts to achieve that are something that I think preoccupy all four of these people in in ways that they were never able to really let go of. Um, mm-hmm. They continued to drive their thinking, their writing, um, and Lash and you know Lash's thought took more of a kind of ontological, even metaphysical turn uh, in the last, <clears throat> excuse me, ten or fifteen years of his life. Um, and he was engaged in people in the Augustinian tradition very deeply. And I, I think Freud actually is, is in there even earlier than, <clears throat> excuse me, the end of his, uh, of his uh, you know, the final years of his career. But people like Jonathan Edwards, Reinhold Niebuhr became very important uh, to, to Lash. Um, so Updike and his, um, his kind of Lutheran um, sensibilities and formation and that kind of thing i think it would, i think that would be an interesting conversation to say the least so yes yeah, so augustine does seem to be the sort of in some sense the odd one out there because of obviously the, the theological background do you think lash is sort of if if there is sort of just a religious trajectory there within his life do you think that's overlooked in terms of his work um I think it's easy to do that uh, if you look at the work from his mid period, by which he's most well known. Um, but by the time he by the time he dies, uh, unfortunately, uh, so young uh, at age sixty one in nineteen ninety four, um, there's a sort of a general recognition among his close readers that this had been a serious turn in his life, um, and he uh, he's described by one of his later reviewers. Uh, the historian James Kloppenberg is having a kind of ascetic religiosity. Um, but he, of course, there's no conversion. There's no, you know, public affiliation with any kind of religious tradition even. But it's something that he seems to continually uh, be going back to. In fact, his last book, uh, The Revolt of the Elites, published posthumously, um, he closes, uh, at least the book closes with a with an essay called The Soul of Man Under Secularism. And uh, and he concludes the essay um, uh, with this sentence. He says, but now that we are beginning to grasp the limits of our control over the natural world, it is an illusion to invoke Freud once again, the future of which is very much in doubt, an illusion more problematical, certainly, than the future of religion. And he was talking there about the illusion of mastery that was he sees as so central to the dominant tradition of Western politics. So I think he had his turn toward religion uh, was quiet, but it was deep. Um, and it became something that he I think he found himself needing to grapple with uh, after the uh, culture of narcissism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was, was done. So I think I, the other thing about Augustine, too, that's curious is, you know, of course, Augustine was not himself always Augustine. <laughs> mm-hmm. He was uh, he was himself an older convert uh, who had an immensely um, uh, 
sort of conflicted, he lived an immensely conflicted intellectual and religious life in the years prior to his conversion and in the years, I would say, after his conversion uh, in terms of his spirit. And I think that sense of deep conflict and wrestling is something that um, that you feel page by page with Lash. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this sort of almost mirrors in a way another, well, the, I guess that the, the primary sort of conversion for Lash, which is a strange one because I hadn't mm-hmm. read, I'd read Lash's work, um, but... I'd never read the biography and it was a great, it's a great book. I recommend it to everyone. Um, but what surprised me was Lash begins, as you say, in this militantly secularist household, which is also seems to be militantly sort of progressive. So Lash mm-hmm. begins, Matt Lash begins as this progressive. <laughs> yeah. And then as he, uh, sort of proceeds, he actually sort of, I don't know if he becomes a Marxist, but he seems to flirt with it for a, quite a while. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then, and now, uh, he would be characterized by 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 some. I mean, this isn't how I would characterize him. Some would probably characterize Lash as quite far right now, but many would characterize him as conservative. So we have yeah. this like this this almost a horseshoe, a complete horseshoe. So what do you think are the, the the key factors in Lash's thought which made him, you know, alter his perception so radically? Yeah, I'm not sure how much they were radically altered. I I, I think that. Um... I think a lot of his initial convictions are deepened uh, and they're deepened in a way that has a kind of ideological dimension that he works out over the course of these decades. Um, I see, you know, we talk about these categories of left and right and conservative and liberal. Um, One of the things that he began to toy with in the eighties was whether these categories have any broader meaning anymore by 1980, 82, 83, he begins to, question whether the idea of the left itself has any coherence and as i started and i thought about this over over these years uh working on him in a way that made me wonder if what we really have in the left versus in the left right spectrum is a sort of vestige of christendom Mm -hmm. um and uh, i guess this is in some ways a chestertonian insight um who begins orthodoxy uh in 1909 i think it is 1908 uh with this suggestion that what's really happening in the modern world is not the the killing off of the christian virtues it's just the virtues run wild um going in all kinds of different directions so you have uh you know you have some people who are seizing on to this dimension of the old kind of christian vision or these christian sensibilities and other kind of ideological directions but they're all sort of un, unmoored from the older theological traditions in which they had emerged. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think, you know, there's different ways in which the classical leftist orientations reflect uh, notions of justice that emerge out of this old order and then the conservative notions of order and all these sorts of things. Um, but I think that Lash, uh, there were just these different elements within these this these older constructions, these kind of moral ideological constructions that he found himself deeply committed to and attached to. And um, and I think that he saw as Christendom continued to wane, as it were, and de- de-Christianization is taking place and secularizing of society is taking place and people are less and less living even within the moral universes that are created. Um, uh, and that even the leftists of the early 20th century, for instance, are very committed to, are, are very deep into, even though they're sort of ideologically moving in different directions. I think he just sort of puts some stakes down and says, this is what I'm going to defend, and I'm going to de- try to develop ideologically a way to do so. So he defends the family and something of its classical form um, within Christendom, and, and yet he completely uh sees capitalism as the enemy of this and so he writes this book in 1977 haven in a heartless world um to defend the the ultimate necessity of the family for a liberal democracy for a decent society even though he's writing very much as a secularist and in his own mind as a as a kind of freudian marxist um but that became the the kind of thing that he was gonna he was gonna 
stake his claim to that this was a crucial cru- politically a crucial institution needed to be defended against these other elements that were taking place so is that conservative i think it's i think yeah there's a kind of conservatism to that but it's also kind of radical um in the sense of it going down to his conception of what a root what was at the root of a good order um and then you defend that against other things <laughs> that are attacking it even things that other conservatives are touting like liberal capitalism so all that to say um uh i'm not sure that it's a i'm not sure it's a big change i think it's a define i think i think just things just come to sharper definition and as the broader civilization is itself shifting and changing he's uh he's holding on to some things that other people are happier to leave behind it's strange his his defense of the family is almost mirrors um, Adorno's in that it's Mm -hmm. this defense in that the family is seen by Adorno and by Latch as, as that sort of uh, unit or institution. I don't like to call it an institution Mm -hmm. because it's more organic than that, which Mm -hmm. can, you know, fend off capitalism. It's the thing which, which can. So, and that, that probably helped inspire him to be sure. Horkheimer was huge for him in this moment. Was sort of deciding that he's going to hang on to, you know, so that's quite surprising. Did he have more direct influence from the Frankfurt School, or is it largely Horkheimer or Adorno? I think he read the Frankfurt School uh, in a general way, like a lot of the you know neo Marxists of his vintage. You know, were mm-hmm. were sort of very conversant in. Um, he singles out Horkheimer later as as sort of inspiring a kind of courage to resist the dominant ideological positions and and trends and to kind of to to kind of burrow down on this point especially so so what was his um view of capitalism in in that moment well i think that he was deeply committed to uh the vision of society that was uh localist that was decentralized that was anchored in familial relations that were stout enough and rich enough that would make it possible to work through the uh, messiness of everyday relations between parents and children. Um, His argument in Haven and Heartless World is certainly premised on the inevitability of profound psychic conflict and tension between human beings in general, between parents and children. Um, But he thought that the family was absolutely crucial as the place where we would learn to confront these terrors of the inner life and then work toward um, responsible, mature, loving relationships with one another. And this then would become the basis for a democracy that would make possible people who were courageous uh, and virtuous enough, although he wouldn't use the language of virtue until after uh, uh, he reads McIntyre in the 80s. Um, but uh, uh, people who would be able to resist the inevitable attempts of uh, other people to gain power and use it to their advantage. So he sees capitalism is fundamentally, I think, working against democratic civilization. And it, it's attacking it at its most... Uh, in attacking and diminishing and sort of corrupting the influence of parents over their children, the relations between parents and their children, the integrity of local life, the integrity of neighborhoods, the integrity of professions. Um, Lash was very committed to uh, basic pre-industrial forms of labor that he thought were crucial for human development, learning to learning crafts. Um, people like William Morris uh, are important for Lash, Raymond Williams, um, a lot of the British Marxists of the 60s um, and 70s. So he sees capitalism as having this disintegrating effect, whereas human beings needed to be in any event, in any political economy, we're up against the challenge of trying to maintain the good things that a decent society requires in terms of practices, in terms of ways of life, in terms of... of uh, you know, just basic life, life orders. So his sort of argument to be able to get beyond capitalism is actually sort of a, a reversion to that older form of leftism where you, you know, you are united as a, let's say a union or a commune or something. Mm-hmm. 
adhere as a group. Yeah, I think that's true. Although I think he would want to, uh, he would want to honor family and fidelity to family, unlike the more libertarian forms of community that some on the left are are beginning. And this is something again that kind of people say he left the left, and, and and this is probably where he might say, you know, the left left. <laughs> left us uh by the 1970s you know by the 1960s by the 1970s um uh because they they cease feeling that freedom lay through the possibility of long-term enduring familial ties neighborhood ties you know that there's this just more the libertarian um impulses that begin to begin to dominate which he sees as is sort of regressive. Do you think that's perhaps where this criticism of progress comes in? That the, the you know, that this idea of progress sort of gets hijacked by capitalism mm-hmm. and by those, by those urges, by those libertarian urges. So it gets confused as to what it actually is we, we should be progressing towards. You know, he had been skeptical of progress even as a young, <laughs> even as a young graduate student in his early twenties. Um, he was, he was put off by the sort of sunny side progressivism of the progressive era that his own parents had been so influenced by. Um, the, the hope that through rational inquiry and scientific means, we could construct this ideal society that would, you know, that would leave us in this sort of fundamentally tr- different transformed place as human beings i mean this is where this is where i go back to the augustinian sort of dimension that's deep in his thought um like many people coming of age after world war ii um again he's born in 1932 he's a child of the depression he's 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 growing up um and and the words you know the names like auschwitz um and hiroshima are just part of the landscape of his of his world as a teenager um so he just doesn't think he thinks there's something fundamentally flawed at its foundation with this kind of liberal optimism that was so characteristic of uh the generation preceding his a couple generations preceding his of intellectuals so i think that I think that, and partly in his case, uh, he knows so much about tensions between parents and children because of the tensions that he lived with his own, his own parents. He his uh, he would later say that he used to go home from Harvard to his philosopher mother and just tick her off with all this existential mm-hmm. sort of uh, language and writers that he was reading and uh, and 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 taking a kind of perverse delight and and. In, in the whole, you know, in these exchanges, he was very close to his parents. Uh, uh, it's a, I mean, there were the letters between his parents uh, and him from his his college years in 1950 into his mother dies in the early 1980s, and his father he out, his father outlives him. I mean, these are themselves worthy of publication. If we were in a world where Lash was more of a hero, I'm sure it would already be done. Um, but um, uh, so I and so I think the question of progress for him is rooted in a dissatisfaction with the enlightened, uh, with the American Enlightenment, as it were, <laughs> the uh, the kind of happy, uh, optimistic, progressive American style that he has very little interest in. He he, um, his father-in-law is um, is a, a, an eminent historian and a f- sort of public intellectual named Henry Steele Commager. Um, who taught at Columbia and uh, and his father-in-law um, uh, I'm trying to think, okay, his father, I think it was his father-in-law who would set him up early on with different kinds of publishing opportunities. And one time, one of them was, I think this came through Commager. I may be wrong about this, but was to, uh, to write a forward to Charles Dickens uh, little book on his visit to America. I can't remember what it was called now. Note, Notes on America, perhaps, something like that, that I think was initially published serially. And uh, it's just really interesting to read Lash at about age 30, just using all of Dickens' dissatisfactions with America <laughs> to express his own as a young, you know, his own sort of take on the American scene. But the American progressive optimism is just something he has no 
Uh, he has no sense of uh, affinity for uh, and has very, very deeply developed reasons for, for opposing it. Um, and so that becomes, I think, the sort of the initial uh, he never feels that kind of identity. He, he, and as much as he's a liberal ever, it's identified with this kind of ne Reinhold Niebuhr um, realism. But uh, uh, so then Mar Marxism becomes attracted to him, to him because it helps to explain so many of these, he thinks at least for a time, so many of these things that he think have got, has gone wrong in America um, and culminating perhaps in this phase of his life with his, last chapter of the culture of narcissism in which he says basically we have a return of uh, authoritarian rule via capitalism um and and that's pulled off in the name of progress so progress is the grand you know false consciousness the the the, the illusion um that makes possible the uh you know the triumph of this controlling system well, that's what I was going to ask. If, if for Lash progress, you know, this definition of progress has been changed, um, what is it? What are we actually progressing towards? What's actually happening? But you, uh, I think, I think what he's, I think what he sees happening is the grand corrupting of uh, the decent society, of democracy, of the beloved community. Uh, not that he thinks it was ever intact. A lot of people mistake Lash for a kind of nostalgic thinker, and I, I puzzle through that because I. I don't see him looking back to a golden age. Um, I see him with ideals that come out of past moments in our civilization's history that he thinks are worth aiming for. But I don't think he goes back and he says, that's when we did it. You know, <laughs> that's when that's when it was right. For him, there's just domination, domination. I mean, he reads Foucault with much, much interest and respect all through the 70s. Um, he, he, you know, the, the, the idea that the enlightenment was something that was turned toward, uh, another species of domination resonates entirely with him. Where does he sort of part ways with Foucault? I don't think Lash was a moral libertarian. Okay. I think okay. Lash wanted, I think Lash had some sense of a moral order that he does not know how to explain and describe, but he thinks that somehow there's something to which human beings must submit must align themselves there's some there's something that we're made to live within and i think this is there's a there's a kind of joint biography waiting to be written a, a, a kind of group biography about some of these thinkers and alistair mcintyre is certainly another one that comes to mind who has this kind of left you know and mcintyre's story is more colorful apparently um but you know has this kind of history as a leftist and then comes back to his catholic roots and um, and then begins to reinterpret and Lash reads McIntyre reinterpreting uh, in this grand reinterpreting uh, project and, and after virtue. And, uh, and I think it begins to bring this sort of possibility of ontology and language in uh, into his work in a way that we don't see in the very, in the much more structural arguments that are so characteristic of the, of the, you know, kind of intellectuals and, and social sciences in the sixties and seventies. Um, do you think, do you think that's why he sort of had to write an entire book based around narcissism, um, which is, <laughs> which is so, it's so heavy, you know, if you, if you, if you, I think if you went into that book off face value, you might believe that it's just going to be a, a, should we say uh, like a phenomenal social criticism whereas mm -hmm. you know it, as you as you state lash is l emphasizing heavily on freudian analysis yeah and this is something that is actually far deeper um as you've mentioned a few times it does come across often as an ontological thing it's like an mm -hmm. ontological narcissism where something that's going on at a societal level is altering yeah. our you know mm -hmm. our relation to ourselves as, as a being do you think yeah. that's what lash was trying to sort of attend to there I think that's exactly right. And I think that it was the, uh, uh, it was the, <laughs> I mean, he got hammered from all possible sides uh, by the time he wrote those two books, Haven and Heartless World and Narcissism. And the effect I think was to drive him into a deeper underpinning for his analysis. I mean, he had, he had begun to move in this direction of sort of like a deepening encounter with Freud in the, in the, in the early seventies um, and had done, I mean, the guy um, 
his reading life uh, is just extraordinary. And he imbibes and is just saturated in all of this, uh, in this discourse um, surrounding Freud and the intersection of Freud and Marx. Um, and, uh, and so he, out of this, eventually by the mid seventies, he comes out with these two books and, and, and I, I almost think culture of narcissism, it's not an afterthought, but it was sort of, it, I think it was an unplanned book. I think, uh, Haven in a Heartless World was supposed to be the start of a, uh, was sort of like the theoretical introduction to this big, uh, uh, study, historical study on the family. Um, and he develops this kind of theoretical start, but then he has all of these, by this time he has all of this, uh, that's just filling his mind and it's developed into this theory <laughs> of society that he plays out in culture narcissism, this sort of, that he, he kind of tosses off. I mean, it's a very quickly written book and he's shocked by its, by his success. And I think that, you know, and then it gets so much attention, which is even more shocking. He was a very retiring, um, sort of person, um, in a, in a kind of general sense, although he was very richly convivial in you know, kind of smaller circles uh, of, of people and intimates and so on. But um, uh, anyway, all of the exposure <laughs> and everything pushed him into new places, of course, as well as just the fact that Freud himself was, was beginning to wane in terms of influence generally. Um, by the time we get into the end of the seventies, I almost kind of see nar the narcissism book as the last gasp of kind of the power of Freud over the uh, kind of Western intellectuals. Um, the linguistic turn takes things in different directions. Um, who do you so see? They, who do you see sort of replacing Freud at that moment? For Lash, or just uh, in general? Yeah, well, for Lash, and then in general. Yeah, that's a good question. I've kind of imagined uh, a big hole where freud used to be in our in our common life um freud made possible a kind of deep interrogation of the self and others that um i remember as a you know kind of myself coming of age in the 80s it was sort of in the aftermath of that um but it seems to me that we don't have those kinds of conversations so much anymore now we talk about going to a therapist instead of to a psychiatrist or a counselor, you know, we have, much, things are much more, um, our life is something that we manage. This is a kind of a McIntyre motif, I guess. Um, and, uh, and we, we don't look, I'm not, I'm not sure that we look deep or at least deep in these kinds of ways that Freud took us in terms of lash. I think lash goes toward, toward religious self more self-consciously religious thinkers and theological thinkers and and i think i my, i think mcintyre had a had a part in that actually because mcintyre ends up describing in after virtue uh, uh a, a a kind of series of characters and and develops these portraits that sound a lot that sound pretty nar narcissistic, but he talks about emotivism and he, he he brings in other kinds of discourses into Lash's thinking. Um, do, you, do you think it's sort of the same problem again in that you can't have Freud with this sort of um, grand sweeping underlying theory of what it is, you know, delving deep into the, the human psyche if your culture is heading towards a, as you, as you called it, a moral libertarianism? Those two things right. are sort of incompatible yeah. and, and and not to mention the whole post-structural uh, uh uh elimination of this of the coherent self that freud was sort of imagining in a, in a very in i mean in a very dark darkly coherent self but uh the post-humanism that that sees this the self is just a series of intersecting discourses and things like that and the fluidity that's coming about through the digital age you know that's emerging i i, I think that we just um, we're not alone with ourselves in the way that we were um, in the age of Freud. Um, and, and Lash bemoans this. He talks, uh, one of his key phrases is uh, the collapse of the interior life, mm -hmm. the interior life. And I think uh, a post-humanist world, interiority in a post-humanist world is very different from the kind of interiority that, that predates it. My sense, at least. I don't know. And I'd be curious what you think about who does that, Does anybody replace Freud to you? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I was just thinking that I think 
in certain spheres, yes, I think a lot of people on the in the continentals, a lot of people went to Lacan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think perhaps in spiritual circles, many people went to Jung. But actually, no, both of those camps never really <laughs> ventured back to Freud to use, you know, Lacan was on about a return to Freud. But I don't think there's anyone who was, you know, you know, the big, big clear that everyone, someone, I mean, Marx always stayed there. I think Marx, mm-hmm. Marx always retained his place. But right. The, the, the structures are still there that Marx <laughs> talked about, but the self that Freud talked about, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We, it's sort of like the postmodern tyranny of, you know, interjecting a question but you never attend to the answer right you come <laughs> in you come in and destroy something and then you yeah. run we run away <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> and i think we run away into irony i think I, it's yeah, uh completely i think agree. that's our that's our that's our resting point um we don't need the existential uh crisis and climax and resolution um we uh we just kind of flit away, you know. But th- but that's sort of extremely, you know, uh, um, you know, that's along the lines of what Lash is is talking about in um, in narcissism. In that it's narcissistic to be cons- consistently ironic because you're all you're you're just constantly saying, you know, look at me, I I get the joke, I've you know, I know mm-hmm. all this. So do you think that's why? Do you think narcissism for Lash was more important because it does? It does include all these, these, you know, things such as irony, these sort of strange mm. traits that we sort of overlook. That's interesting. Yeah. It was a very capacious concept, way more capacious than most of his readers or, and critics had any idea of. Um, and I think maybe that's why your earlier good point that it's a book that feels like it's deepening in its importance because it's becoming revealed as a much more concerning um phenomenon than than we could see and then maybe he could see maybe he would himself uh, be surprised by his own acuity <laughs> um you know had he had he lived into it but i think that he was uh I, one of his former students described him as a phenomenologist who never really read phenomenology <laughs> but that he was sort of that by his he had sort of developed that mode of apprehension and perception and that and that sort of understanding of it and he um uh and i think he could see uh, the part of him that wanted to become a novelist a lot of that person was who wrote the culture of narcissism okay. that's just that bringing together of self and society and you know f- telling the story and he um yeah he <laughs> So I think that the 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 mood, if you know, if he had been able to capture this kind of thing in fiction, it would have been very interesting to see what he would have come up with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think for listeners who haven't read it, it's it's a book that's far beyond just an analysis of what happens yeah. in a self centered society. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He uh, he did not think it was the problem with self centeredness. He thought it was the problem was the diminishing of the self, the weakening of the self, the collapse of the self, um, the retreat of the self. He saw he saw an ideal that humans should mature in, into being replaced by another kind of ideal that was only there because people had lost the ability, the strength, as, as it were, to become that other sort of person. They had just sort of lost that, you know, so you kind of diminished in form. And again, maybe this follows another of a, a kind of an Augustinian um, mode of thinking about goodness and evil, where for Augustine, you know, evil was the diminishing of the good. Um, and as that happens, there's a kind of, you know, in Freudian terms, a kind of regression. Um, but there's something that's lost and when that thing is lost it it leads to comedy it leads to tragedy it leads to satire i mean it's just like whoa the thing is not what it used to be look at it that's funny you know that's Mm -hmm. that's that's the stuff of caricature um and there's a fair amount of that i mean the book's a satire i mean culture of narcissism in its own it's a deep satire it's it's satirical in the sense that uh he is certainly exaggerating um in the sense of 
giving exaggerated attention to certain dimensions that are happening. And they're only going to continue to enlarge, I think, in our public space in the years after this. Um, do, you, do you think that that's, that's why it's so, so important for, for Lash that we sort of, you know, he, you know, as you said at the start, we, we should re- read widely as in history, mm-hmm. um, you know, read broadly as well. Uh, and sort of read deeply, not to sound too cheap, but make sure we have this connection to to history. And one mm-hmm. of the things that that comes up time and time again in the biography is that he retains this sort of extreme importance for mm-hmm. people to keep connected to history. Yeah. Because if you keep connected to history, you can, you know, you can have this this assessment of what's what's going to happen, what's mm-hmm. you know what's come before. And do you think that that's that's where we can find in that detachment from history and historical knowledge the beginning of sort of capitalist man, where just nothing really matters because you're no longer beholden to anything of, you know, value or authenticity or lineage or heritage. Right, and you have no stake in it either because your life, your decisions are made for you by the limited choices that are made available to you by the capitalists, uh, the institutions that emerge in the capitalism and schooling or, uh, you know, or, and so on. So there are just uh, this, the lack, the disappearance of counter forces institutionally, culturally to show you another way. Um, and that's, that's no recipe for human wholeness, you know, mm. um, as he thinks about it. And again, these are the kinds of old words or concepts that make him look conservative, um, you know, when you even talk about such a thing as human wholeness, what could that possibly mean? But that's what he's, that's like I said earlier, that's where he decides to stake his, you know, stake his ground and say, no, I think this is, this is a good that we need to work toward and to hold. I don't know where it comes from necessarily. I'm not making claims about any, I just think that it exists. Mm-hmm. I think that's important though, too. Yeah. That's not something you see very, very much anymore. I think since, so we brought them up, but since the post-structuralists, everyone sort of tiptoes around, you know, staking a claim. Exactly. Sure. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, what, because a state, you know, to stake a claim is just a power move. That's all it can ever be. Um, and uh, I think Lash is having none of that. So do you think for Lash then this sort uh, actually what, what we've headed into sort of in the last maybe five years, I'd say it's, it's accelerated very quickly, but the sort of uh, cult of atomized identity, where the most important mm. thing is to sort of be able to assemble yourself as a, you know, a certain mm-hmm. uh, collection of brands or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Th- do you think that's sort of become our new religion in a la- like a Lashian sense? A kind of uh, uh, an ongoing, uh, f- the latest form of an ongoing religious trajectory, yeah. Uh, I think he, uh, I mean, he, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking he, um, I'm trying to think of this, uh, if I could find this passage in the book, he talks, um, as he sees the counterculture emerging in the late sixties, he's very concerned that it's going to take this direction. <laughs> he doesn't see, he can't foresee all the kinds of technology, the ways that technology and the technological infrastructure, that I think is going to push things in this direction. It's going to facilitate it. Um, our sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, breaking of ourselves apart or this sort of final fluidity that we seem to be living now where our bits of ourselves go in all kinds of different directions all the time. But, um, but I do think that it's this, it does come to have for him, it does come to look like the final realization of that enlightened individualism that is now actually diminishing even the individual. Uh, he's very attracted to the communitarian. I mean, by the, and another thing that happens in the eighties for him is the, the rise of communitarian, the communitarian thinkers that, that movement, uh, on the American scene, Michael Sandel, uh, a Harvard government professor is a, a, a big figure who takes on John Rawls theory of justice. Um, but he's looking for people who are interested in finding non-individualistic ways to conceive mm-hmm. of human beings and then to present publicly another vision, a possibility. Um, and uh, and he does this out of fear that we are going to be sort of the play, we are the playthings of forces that are all too happy to see us fractured in this way. Yeah. Okay. But because of, as you say, the kind of religious, uh, uh, you know, the 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 
the religiosity, there's a kind of religious cult of the self that, um, that, that, that makes it tough to, to make that case. Cause we're very attached to it. Uh, it's just, it is sacred to us, I think. It's interesting that you call it a trajectory. Do you think Lash had any idea where it might end or where it's trying mm-hmm. to head? I think he, I think his fear was, it was just lead to domination, to utter domination in a way that would lead to, and I think he saw that as a profound injustice, okay. you know, I mean, if, if to be just is to bring things together that deserve to be joined, to put things together whole, uh, I think he was working with the conception of human well-being, human flourishing that saw uh, justice in community, <laughs> you know, Um not not atomized bits and pieces of what were formerly known as human beings, you know. Okay, okay. So the last question then is, why do you think it is that um, Lash has been so overlooked and sort of forgotten, especially considering culture of narcissism, uh, you know, it was a bestseller. It even says that on the, the new cover. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, it won it won the uh, the National Book Award. You know, it was a big big yeah. text. What happened? Well, this is uh, I came across the this uh, quotation by Louis Dupre, uh, 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 philosopher, and he says, "In a period of frantic change, no thinkers vanish more rapidly than those of the recent past. Hmm. Their ideas are not are not so much refuted." is shoved aside for a succession of new ones that address the present more directly. We secretly fear the ideas of the past, not those of the remote past, but of the past still remembered. Their growing paleness reminds us uncomfortably of the transiency of our own thought. Yeah. I mean, that's a sort of interesting existential kind of reflection, but I think it has something to do with it. I mean, Lash was so yesterday. Lash was so, you know, whatever, 80s, 70s. Lash, well, it's that's exactly what it felt like in, you know, about the year 2000, 2000 you know, late 90s. Um, uh, yeah, we've, we've heard him. We've understood him. We've ingested him. Um, uh, I think that because what happened just after his death in terms of this massive transition uh, and transformation of our societies via uh, digital media, I think that puts someone like him into instant eclipse, whether deservedly or not. I mean, I was just thinking about this today. Who would have thought when I started to work on this book that something like this would be taking place today? <laughs> I mean, who, you know, and, uh, and on the one hand, the return of radio via podcast, but on the other hand, that I'm having a conversation with uh you know, with someone across the ocean, uh, that's, you know, it's just all these things have just changed things in ways that we're just catching up on, or perhaps we're beginning to see. So I think the return of Lash into discourse, um, is a sign that he's receded enough that we, we have the courage to go back and revisit him. Um, and I think we can see things that we couldn't see as well, uh, even 20 years ago about his, about his legacy. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe we just had enough of the fulfillment of his own prophecies to make him seem like a prophet that we can afford to honor. Okay. Okay. Where would you advise uh, new new readers to begin with Lash? Uh, that's a good question. People in my generation, I was born in 1966, um, tended to come across Lash at the end of his life. And uh, so for me, that feels like the best starting place because it made uh, sense of my world that I was living in, uh, in the, in the, in the eighties into the nineties. Um, so I would say that if you're interested in deep, uh, a deep study of the broader context, uh, of the concerns that he has, um, that is the American, but also the European, he, he, he does a bit of European history, the true and only heaven, Progress and his critics, 1991, is just, uh, it's his magnum opus. It's a, a deeply underappreciated book, um, but profound, uh, resonant, uh, an attempt to create a counter narrative of American history via uh, critics of the progressive ideal, of the not the progressive ideal, but progressive civilization from the 17th century on i mean it's a it's a deep story and it's intended to make us rethink everything and to realize that those of us who feel critical of this development are not alone and we're in the company of some pretty fine thinkers um and and communities 
But if you're really interested in trying to get a, a, a sense of the kind of psychological and, and kind of spiritual tenor of the, of the age, the culture of narcissism, and then it's something of a sequel, the minimal self are, are well worth reading. And I, I encourage reading both together, <laughs> read the nar- culture of narcissism, and then see the course corrections that he makes in the, in the follow-up uh, okay. in 19, 1984, the minimal self. Are you currently working on um, anything lash related? That's a uh, sort of. Um, I'm interested in uh, the phenomenon of localism as it's been emerging in the West uh, as a sort of structural response to um, the sorts of capitalist forms of capitalist domination that we've been talking about. And um, I've so I'm in the midst of a study on the American writer, uh, Wendell Berry, um, who's, a who was a part of, became a part of Lash's, you know, sort of bibliography, um, by the end of his life. And, uh, and so the study of localism through the lens of Berry and the different communities, uh, and societies and organizations and publications that he was connected with is sort of a manifestation of this tendency that seems to be pretty broad and actually global at this point. Um, so I kind of see it as the next chapter of his, of Lash's book, The True and Only Heaven, where he's, um, uh, there's like another group of people that follow in this, in this trajectory that's trying to not just be critical of progress, but develop uh, alternate uh, forms of, of community and alternate ways of life in response to it, while also realizing that it's, it's not going to go away. <laughs> the capitalism is, uh, is, is going to die no death. Do you, do you think that that group's sort of argument, because my favorite Wendell Berry quote is um, better than any argument is to wake up in the morning and pick two wet red berries in a cup. Oh, I don't know that. <laughs> no, That's really, wonderful. And uh, do you think that whole movement, you know, post 91, realizing mm-hmm. that capitalism is here to stay, do you think that they're finally saying perhaps we should stop arguing with the beast and yeah. move? <laughs> the Or that the only argument left is to, is to, is to grow the berries and to eat them and then to invite others, you know, to the table, so to speak. Yeah. I, I think it's, sorry. Go yeah. Ahead. And I mean, I just, I think the localist movement is, uh, is, a it's just a kind of outrageous act of hope. And, uh, part of my own query is to figure out the, is to try to get a sense of this amount of delusion that's attached to it. Um, and to try to understand in relation to the behemoth, it's, uh, you know, that really is, it's just with us. Oh, you mean it, it seems delusional in, in the face of this, you know, this, yeah, I mean, is it this sort of like, yeah, is it this, yeah, I mean, what is this thing? Who are these, because, you know, you get into these groups or these circles and, you know, anytime you have real activists, you just have craziness you have real, you know, you have, uh, you have true believers. Um, and, uh, and some true believers are the ones that, that inspire faith and other true believers are the people who make you want to run in the other direction. And I think you find a good measure of both. But Barry's such an interesting phenomenon. He's two years. In fact, I just published an essay in a, a, a little publication from one of these uh, one of these groups called the Front Porch for Public. Local Culture is their magazine and their issue is on Christopher Lash. And they asked me to write an essay that that's on Barry and Lash together as, as uh, uh, you know, how do I, how do I think about this? How, how might we think about these people in a common trajectory, these two in a common trajectory? So I think Barry's just interesting because uh, he's everywhere in the, in these circles in the, in the U S at least. Um, and I actually had done some research on um, uh, an English poet that he was very, um, it was a very close friend of Kathleen Raines. Um, and, uh, and, and that's been interesting to try to get a sense of the transatlantic Atlantic dimensions of this, but, um, so is this going to be a book? I hope I put, I put it enough into it. That makes me think I can't turn or turn, turn around. <laughs> so sounds great. Well, thanks. I hope, uh, I hope it's ways to keep moving. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Sounds like a good place to to finish up. I'm Eric Miller. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. It's been a delight to be here with you.